The Naval Academy Museum presents a history of the Navy in 100 objects. On December 23, 2013, USS Freedom, Littoral Combat Ship 1, returned from her maiden deployment to Singapore. However, the crew that took her home was completely different from the one that took her to Singapore. While overseas, LCS Freedom had actually swapped crews. This is one of many features of the Navy's new littoral combat ships, multiple crews, similar in design to the way submarines operate today. The LCS has faced significant opposition in its development phases. The design and acquisition phase, still ongoing, was tedious, with two designs eventually being accepted, and the number of total ships to be acquired has been significantly downsized. The ships, nevertheless, are revolutionary in design, with automation replacing crew throughout the ship. Interchangeable weapon and mission modules, space-age designs, and new tactics make them nearly unrecognizable platforms compared to the current U.S. Navy fleet. More importantly, the ships still continue to shift in design, with improvements through trial and error constantly ongoing. The basic concept of a littoral ship is nothing new. In fact, the British Navy had a littoral vessel in operation prior to the Revolutionary War, and today Grant Walker will take us through that ship's design. Also, it is not unusual for ships to be redesigned mid-acquisition and changed. Donald Pruell will walk us through a historical precedent of such a scenario. Ships have changed and been adapted over centuries, and no doubt the LCS will continue to undergo growing pains. But if history is any indication, the program will eventually find the right balance, even if the result is not what was originally intended. To help us understand how ship designs have evolved and been adapted over the years, we turn to the Naval Academy Museum's priceless collection of model ships. But although we will be going to the exhibits to discuss some of them, today we are actually going to spend most of our time behind the scenes in the restoration and modeling shop beneath the museum where a team of skilled professionals and volunteers labors to preserve and create memories of yesterday's and today's ships. Hopefully, in a hundred years, they will be making models of the LCS and remembering it as one of the most innovative and successful platforms of the Navy. Today, we are going to cover a lot of history. After all, there's 300 years worth of model ships to discuss. Hello, my name is Grant Walker. I'm the Education Specialist at the United States Naval Academy Museum. We're standing here uh, in front of a case with two different kinds of British dockyard ship models. Again, dockyard ship models is a generic term referring to scale models that were built at the same time and in the same place as the ship they replicate during the age of sail. All of the great maritime powers in the Age of Sail made dockyard models, but the English made the largest number of them for the longest continuous span of time, and only the English ones uh, remained in private hands, uh, enabling Colonel Henry H. Rogers, an American colonel, very wealthy, to purchase uh, almost 50 of these dockyard models, which he bequeathed to the Academy in 1935. On the upper shelf here, we have the older style model. This is called a Navy Board model. And it's, it, these, this is the style that models were built in in England from the early 1600s until about 1725 or 30. And it's typified by the fact that the lower portion of the hull is unplanked, exposing the vertical frames that made up the frame of the hull. First they would lay down the keel, and then they would um, frame the thing up with these vertical frame timbers, and only then would they plank it with horizontal planking, both outside and inside, sheathing those vertical frames. For reasons we don't really understand, when it came to building the models, the model makers stopped at the, essentially at the waterline, exposing the lower portion of the uh, hull frame to vision, to, uh, to, to view. This style of model making gradually gave way to a new style of model making called the Georgian style in the 1720s and 30s. In this model down here, which represents a ship from uh, about 1775 to 85, as you can see, the entire hull is fully planked 
all the way from the top of the sides down to the keel. The thing about this model is inside there are no vertical frames. It's made up actually of just a couple of planks of wood that are shaped to the hull uh, shape at the different water lines, uh, fared and smoothed off and then covered with this planking. So while this one looks more like an actual ship, in fact, this one is built more like the actual ships were built. This model down here represents a Swan class sloop. She was a sloop of war uh, and this kind of ship was uh, produced in large numbers during the Seven Years War of 1756 to 63 in England. Um, it's actually like a mini frigate, very similar to the frigate style, but she didn't carry as much guns. She was smaller and she was lighter draft, so ships like this were very popular for inshore work. Then at the outset of the American Revolution, the design was revived, modified a bit, and we came up with this Swan class sloop and this is one of quite a few that were built between 1775 and 1785. One of those ships very similar to the Swan class was called the Otter. It was the same layout, just two feet shorter. And it's interesting to know that in 1776, after having bombarded Norfolk, the Otter sailed up to the Chesapeake Bay uh, with the intention of bombarding Baltimore. Now that didn't happen, but the mere threat of the otter passing by the port of Annapolis caused panic in the city, and uh, the city fathers ordered uh, Annapolis to be evacuated in case the otter were to uh, bombard her because there were no defenses against her. She chose not to. She captured five or six uh, other American ships in the Chesapeake, and she took them back down south rather than uh, bombarding Annapolis and Baltimore, but it's, uh, it's an interesting example of how these smaller ships were actually more useful to the British when they were fighting the Americans than their large uh, men of war, their ships of the line, and so forth. Now we head downstairs to the model shop with Don Pruel. All right, this is the, uh, the original proposed uh, version of the USS Maine. This model dates back to 1888. We received it in 1939 from the Brooklyn Navy Yard where the ship was built. All right. When we received it in 1939, the midshipmen started working on it. I've got a photograph here. You can see when we, you know, you can take this up or shoot this later. That's when we first received the model when this building was brand new in 1939. And uh, the midshipmen started working on it in 1939 to finish it because the model wasn't completed. All right. Uh, obviously, in 1941, their attention was drawn to something a little bit more important than model building, like maybe the beginning of World War II. So uh, obviously uh, they, their interest in model building pretty much uh, left them at that point. But what's really neat about this model is that if you notice on this one, it has a, both a foremast, a main mast, and a hole for the mizzen mast. The original main was supposed to have mast and sails. Halfway through the construction of the main, they decided that sail was no longer needed as a secondary propulsion system. So they went strictly coal burner and put two what they call military masts or pole masts on the ship. And that's how you see her uh, when she's entering uh, Havana Harbor just before she was stunk prior to, obviously, the beginning of the Spanish-American War. So uh, what they did is they started on this model, decided that, like I mentioned about the propulsion systems, they stopped on this one and started a second model. And the second model is the actual builder's model of the ship as completed. And that's within the Navy collection uh, that's over at Carter Rock. I'm not exactly sure where that one's being uh, exhibited now. But what we're going to do is we're going to complete this model. We, we're picking up from where the midshipmen, midshipmen stopped. We've cleaned it. Uh, we're going to add to it. We're going to go ahead and put all the mast in. We're going to put the uh, the yard's in, we're going to actually put her under full sail, and then she's going to go over to the O Club behind us, behind the bar, and I figure after about the third drink, it should bring up some topics of conversation, the fact that the main never had mass and sails, but certainly she pr was proposed to have had them, as you can see in the uh, lithograph there, dating back to that time period. So this is really a unique model in itself. Uh, what's also unique, and now sitting on the other side, it has the two torpedo boats, uh, mounted up here on the uh, on the rails, which the ship never received, but she was supposed to have. And you can even see them in the in the in the lithograph. So I'm quite sure you'll take a picture of that in a little bit. 
Uh, but that pretty much is this model here. Uh, very unique, very unique model, and, and one of our early original builders' models here in the U.S. Um, some interesting ones, or ones that are going to go on display. Over there is the uh, uh, model of the Langley CV1 that's being built on this bench. But I have the Collier, the Jupiter, of which she was built from up there. So we're going to display both of those together, both the Collier and CV1, so you can see what she looked like and then what she was converted into, the U.S. Navy's first aircraft carrier. This model here that's being built on the next bench over there, that's going to be the USS Galveston CLG-3, the U.S.'s first missile cruiser, basically. And just so happened it's being built by a crew member that used to serve on the ship. So, and that's going to go upstairs and, and also be displayed within the, uh, the uh, Vietnam uh, exhibits upstairs because she was used in Vietnam. Um, like I was saying, they're, they're doing that PG for over there. John's working on the uh, F5L. We have a model over here of new iron sides. Not old iron sides, but new iron sides. Uh, she basically was the Union ship that led the attack on Fort Sumner at the beginning of the Civil War. Uh, she's a converted, converted sailing ship with iron class. As you can see right here, this is how this was. Now this one's all scratch built and built by uh, the, the volunteers here. This is, a, this is a joint project of about two or three people, maybe even four. Uh, but this one's slowly but surely coming along. They're depicting the deck as the deck was originally built with its deck beams. So you can see the gun deck down below with all the, uh, I think it said nine inch dog rings and 250 pound parrots on her uh, gun deck. And they're going to leave a lot of that exposed so you can see the deck below. Very unique, all iron clad side. Good book was written on it, on the uh, new iron sides and the construction and we were able to find original drawings through the Smithsonian uh, of the ship also. In our collection, as you uh, were looking upstairs, I can point you toward that one on that bench over there. That is a prisoner of war model. That was built sometime between uh, 1793 and 1815. Uh, it was built by a French prisoner of some sort in a British prison. Uh, that model actually was crushed. Uh, somehow along the way, I've got 34 prisoner of war models in our collection. 32 are on display upstairs. Uh, I have one on loan to the prisoner of war museum down in uh, uh, Georgia. I can't remember exactly the name of the town. And this is the 34th one. And this is the only one in the collection that actually is now damaged. And we're in the process of uh, rebuilding this particular one. Some light on the subject. Well, let's see if that's going to come out. Yep, there it goes. Not much light. But as you can see, this one, the whole uh, masting and everything was all squashed on it. All right. So what what he is doing is he is supporting all of the mast up, and they're trying to save the majority of the rigging. Okay, because the rigging wasn't broken. A lot of it, the shrouds and things like that. Only the masts in between were broken. So he's keeping tension on these so they keep them up and start fitting pieces in to bring to put tension against the shrouds again and fill the gaps in all of the, uh, the masts. Now, the whole, even the whole bowsprit has been redone. Uh, it, it's an amazing model because even all these dead eyes are all, uh, are all uh, rigged up too. Uh, you can see where the, the, uh, all the uh, uh, rigging is going through both the lower and the upper uh, dead eye. Uh, so they're all rigged also. Incredible models. If you think of the conditions under which the prisoners actually had to, were building these models. I mean, think of the crudest conditions of which you can live, the crudest tools that you can use, and obviously they weren't generating any electricity, so they were working strictly by natural daylight or by candle. And then they're producing works of art like this. I mean, it's incredible. Incredible to see, you know, are these as detailed or, or as uh, accurate as our dockyard models that we have upstairs? No, they're not. But when you when you think of the conditions under which these were built, these are just incredible models.